Hello, knitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Knit Callis, but you probably won't be hearing from him too much today. The video I'm making today is something that, frankly, I don't imagine a lot of people are going to be all that interested in clicking on, which, truth told, is not something I should be doing right now. My videos have been getting buried by the algorithm recently, so from a wanting to make money perspective, I should probably be focusing on making stuff that will help me dig myself out of this weird digital rut that I find myself in. And this video is most definitely not that. I'll be perfectly honest, if I were one of my viewers, I probably wouldn't want to click on this video either. I feel like I'd look at whatever maudlin title I'm sure to give this thing and think like, why is he trying to make me sad? Just shut up and show me some top model clips, nerd. And part of me thinks that maybe I should skip this one. Believe me when I tell you that the amount of time and work I put into this thing will not be worth it because if anything, it will hurt my channel. So the smart thing to do would be to just keep it to myself. Unfortunately, a much larger part of me thinks that I can't do that. I do my best to be honest with my thoughts in these videos, and right now my thoughts are focused on one thing in particular, to the point that I don't think I can properly write about anything else. Because my dog died recently, and it really sucks. So today, instead of dissecting a bad movie or giving my lukewarm hot takes on Shane Dawson, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Her name was Lily, and she was the absolute worst. And like, just know that when I say that she was the worst, that's not me being cute. Like when people post pictures of their friends on Instagram and are like, hanging out with these bozos, she was objectively terrible. If an angel of God came down and was like, we did the math and we've concluded that Lily is the worst creature to have ever existed, I would not be surprised. Well, well I'd be surprised that an angel was talking to me, but not by what the angel had to say. I will give her this, and that's that she was probably the cutest dog that I have ever seen in my life. She was this puffy, wrinkly little thing that kind of looked like if someone put an Ewok in the food dehydrator, and her face was somehow adorable, goofy, and pretty all at once. She, 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 she had a really good face. Unfortunately, looks can only get you so far, and though she was undoubtedly pleasing to the eye, she was horribly offensive to every last one of the other senses. For starters, smell. Like, I don't think that I can sit here and properly convey to you guys the odor that came off of my dog's body, and like, granted, I guess a lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm maybe not the strongest writer in the world, but... Even if I were to find myself in a room with William Shakespeare, Virginia Woolf, and James Joyce, I contend that all of us working together still would not be able to properly express in words the smell th that emanated from my dog. And actually, I'm saying smell, but I should really be saying smells, because there are multiple distinctive ones, each with their own unique points of origin, and each unbearable in their own way. It's hard, but if I had to choose a worst one, I'd probably go with breath, because while all of her aromas were awful to be around, her breath was the only one that felt like it might be actively unsafe for me to inhale. She died fairly recently, but I'm pretty sure that whatever organ was responsible for producing her breath died many years earlier, because that's honestly the only explanation I can think of for the smell that, that doesn't involve demons. Like, I have never personally smelled a zombie apocalypse, but I feel like if I ever do, my first thought will probably be like, Aw, Lily. And it sucked, too, because like I said, I really liked her face, but I had to avoid it at all costs, lest I got caught inside of her miasma and potentially risk my own health. Uh, I, I know that sounds like an overreaction, but I promise you, if you experienced it firsthand, you'd realize that, if anything, I'm underselling it right now. Although, that said, at least her breath was easily avoidable. The, the same could not be said for Lily's general body odor, though, which, while not as unbearable as her breath, was much more all-consuming. She didn't move much or make noises all that often, but if she was in a room, she made her presence felt by sheer scent alone. 
The aroma of her fur hung in the air around her wherever she was, making things just the slightest bit less pleasant for anyone who happened to find themselves in her company. And to make matters worse, I'm pretty sure that her odor was a conscious choice on her part. Like, maybe I'm imagining things, but I swear to God, she was in total control of it. There would be times when I'd take her in from a walk or pick up her food or do something else that she did not appreciate, and I swear to God, she got more pungent. Like, I'm not sure if this is something that dogs can actually do or not, but I believe in my heart that Lily was capable of producing pheromones or something on command as a way of weaponizing her smell against me, and as far as weapons go, it was fairly unpleasant. Because just because her body odor wasn't as bad as the literal worst breath in the entire world, that doesn't mean that it wasn't bad. It was milder to be sure, but still definitely not anything that Yankee Candle is going to be including in their fall line anytime soon. It was kind of indescribable, but if I had to compare my dog smell to something, I'd say like, I don't know, maybe like barbecued mildew? Like, imagine the smelliest attic you've ever set foot in, and then imagine that somebody peed in the corner of that attic about a week ago, and I feel like that would get you in the ballpark of what it was like to be within no shot of my dog. Of course, it didn't help matters that she spent her entire lifetime in major cities, and that she was built like a mop designed to pick up and store dirt. I don't believe that there was a single germ or speck of dust on the sidewalk that Lily didn't inevitably absorb into her luscious locks and allow to fester into an even worse scent than the one that she naturally had. Which, like, I feel like right now a lot of you are probably thinking, like, poor Lily, it's not her fault she was so gross, but, like, it absolutely was. She was a total filth pig who genuinely loved disgusting things and sought out the grossest places she could find. Like... One of her absolute favorite places to hang out was our cat's litter box, and believe me when I tell you, it was not easy getting her out of there. Get out of there. Get, get out of the... Ah, ah! I got her out of the litter box. And I know what a lot of you guys are saying right now. Shut up, you whiny little troll. I hate your videos, and dealing with gross stuff is just a part of being a dog owner. Just give her a bath and get on with your life. And if you are saying that, then one, please be nicer to me. My dog just died. And two, you're absolutely right that bathing Lily would have solved a lot of the problems I've just described here. But unfortunately, we couldn't do that. You see, later in her life, Lily started having stress-induced seizures, which were kind of like the doggy equivalent of a very dramatic person saying, if you do this thing I don't like, I will kill myself. Basically, any time we did anything that may have caused her any amount of anxiety, we had to brace ourselves for the possibility that she might pass out in the most horrific way imaginable, which, while quite stressful for us, seems to have worked very nicely for Lily because it got her out of doing a lot of things she didn't want to do. I'm not even joking. I didn't even risk taking her to the vet for the last few years of her life because it was so full of potential triggers for her that I didn't see the point. It didn't matter what I was taking her in for. If she happened to have a seizure while a vet was seeing her, that was kind of the only thing they ended up focusing on. And so it didn't really feel worth it to pay a lot of money to have someone tell me that my dog got seizures and they were very unpleasant. I, I already knew that. The last time I took her to the vet, it was at the very beginning of the pandemic. So we weren't even allowed to go in with her for her checkup, which... Well, right off the bat, we were setting ourselves up for disaster. When the vet tech came to take her in, I could tell that Lily was already stressed because she was shooting a cloud of odor at me. And so to try and make sure that nothing bad happened, I did my best to really impress upon the technician that Lily needed to be treated as gently as possible because if anything made her too anxious, she would pass out. The technician was like, I got it. I won't do anything stressful. You have nothing to worry about. Then she took Lily into an exam room where she immediately took her rectal temperature. Lily didn't really care for that too much. It wasn't five minutes after they had taken Lily in that the vet came out and started telling me like, 
Unfortunately, we don't feel comfortable continuing with this exam. I think the best thing for you to do would be to take her home and make her comfortable. And if her condition gets worse, you should bring her back here and we can make some very difficult decisions, which basically just translated to them telling me like, your dog seems broken and we think she's going to die soon. And like hearing this, part of me wanted to be like, actually, I don't think she's as frail as she seems because like, I know her triggers and no offense, doc, but I feel pretty confident in my ability to avoid shoving things up her ass. I didn't say that though, because a much larger part of me got where the vet was coming from. Lily's seizures were really scary, and if I were operating through a lens of trying to avoid a potential lawsuit, I would also err on the side of caution and treat them like Lily was dying a horrible death, because that's honestly what they looked like. And this, unfortunately, brings me to the next sense that Lily's existence was an affront to, and that is sound, because the noises that creature made were not pleasant. To her credit, she did choose her words very wisely, and was silent more often than not, save for the occasional snort. That said, though, when she did have something she wanted to say, she made damn sure that you didn't just hear it, you felt it in your bones. It took me a few years to realize this, but Lily didn't really bark so much as she just screamed at the top of her lungs in a way that kind of hurt your eardrum. <laughs> and those were just the noises she was in control of. She had a whole array of involuntary noises she made that were way worse and this unfortunately brings me back to the seizures of it all, because every one of her fainting spells was accompanied by a blood-curdling scream, which to this day remains the worst noise that I have ever heard in my life. Uh, honestly, just thinking about it now makes every muscle in my body tense up a little bit. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of that noise frequency that they think makes people see ghosts because it interacts with the body in such a way that it induces dread, but I do believe in my heart that Lily's screams operated in that same frequency because they truly were that horrible. And just to make matters worse, most of the time, the scream was the first indication we'd get that something was going on. We'd be going about our day like normal and then out of nowhere she'd let out this banshee shriek and fall down and we just have to sit there holding our breath hoping that she'd eventually get back up again. And like I'm very happy to say that the seizures didn't happen as much as they probably could have but still knowing that they were a possibility was... Well let's just say that it kept me on my toes. I spent so much mental space trying to make sure that seizures didn't happen that life with my dog sometimes started to feel like that episode of The Simpsons that was a parody of that episode of The Twilight Zone where everyone had to think happy thoughts or else Bart would punish them, you know? I had to do everything that I could to remove any unpleasantness from her life because if I didn't, there would be consequences for everyone involved. And one of those unpleasant things were baths because... Lest you forget, this has all just been my long over Sherry explanation for why we couldn't groom her. And honestly, that was a problem because Lily was the sort of dog who very much needed to be groomed. The best we could do was this dry shampoo spray I found online, but that didn't really help very much given the circumstances. Spraying her with it kind of felt like the grooming equivalent of if somebody died in my apartment and rather than removing the corpse, I just kind of kicked it into the corner and sprayed a little bit of Febreze over it. I did use it occasionally, but it was mostly out of the guilt I'd feel if I wasn't at least trying something, because, well, I think it was fairly obvious to anyone who met Lily that the spray simply wasn't enough. It didn't fix or even mask the scent so much as it did join forces with it to create a new stench, which was just as bad as her natural musk, if slightly more floral in nature. And her odor wasn't the only negative consequence of her inability to take a bath. Like, she looked soft, but believe me when I tell you that you did not want to touch my dog if you could avoid it. A good chunk of the pets I gave her later in life were done with a brush. And that's not just because she was the kind of dog who needed to be brushed. I just didn't want to make direct physical contact. 
I don't know if that thing has ever happened to you guys where like you touch a piece of trash or something and afterwards your hand looks normal, but you can feel on a microbial level that something's not right. That, like even though you can't see them, you kind of just know that there are weird germs wriggling around on your skin that weren't there a second ago. And you start to feel like maybe you shouldn't touch anything until you can make it to a sink and thoroughly scrub yourself clean. Well, yeah, that was kind of what it was like petting my dog. Although for the record, I'm not a monster. I did still pet her because she was my dog and I loved her. I, I just tried not to do it for very long because if I did, then a very disgusting oily residue would start to build up on my hand. And with that, I'm gonna move on because I feel like if I were to go more in depth, things would get gross. Well, grosser. But yeah, I really wasn't being hyperbolic when I said she was offensive to the majority of the senses, although now that I'm thinking about it, I do feel like, like I'm missing one. Let's see, I did sight, sound, smell, feel. So, so I guess that just leaves taste, which, well, truth told, I never tasted her, but that said, I still feel pretty confident in saying that whatever taste she did have, it wasn't good. Actually, no, I guess the case could be made that that's not even true, because given the amount that she shed, it was impossible to sit in my apartment and not eventually find yourself having to pick one of her hairs off of the tip of your tongue. And honestly, calling it shedding feels generous, because she didn't just shed. She used to expel full clumps of hair from her body that would travel around my apartment like tumbleweeds before ultimately settling down in the hardest possible corners to clean. Like, I'm not even joking, I've vacuumed at least 10 times since she's passed, and I'm still finding full locks of her hair every day. And it didn't matter how much hair she excreted from her body on a daily basis, there was always more. Every single time I brushed her, regardless of how recently I had brushed her last, I could always get what would probably have amounted to about a spool of yarns worth of hair out of her in a single rubdown. Like, I'm not gonna lie, given my knitting hobby, I did seriously consider trying to figure out how to go about making a sweater out of her fur every time I emptied a massive pile of it into the trash. And had it not been for the visible flecks of dead skin scattered throughout those massive piles, I may very well have pursued that idea. Still, for as terrible as it could be having to deal with her fur all the time, I do think that Lily's shedding was indicative of one of her greatest skills in life, and that was her ability to own a room. She mostly blended in with her bed, so a lot of the time people coming into my apartment never even saw Lily, but even when she was camouflaged, it was impossible not to know that she was there. From the stray hairs and odor wafting around in the air to the pee pads and spilt water bowls strewn across my floor, Lily's mark on my home was impossible to deny. And like, that's not even mentioning the massive messes she left in her wake. Every single goddamn time she moved. Everything would be nice and calm, then you'd briefly turn your head and by the time you turn back around, Lily would have somehow managed to pee on the floor, bunch up her pee pad, spill her water bowl, drop some of her meat slop from her food bowl, and then step in said meat slop all in a span of time that wouldn't make sense for a normal creature, much less one with a top speed of two miles per hour, such as herself. I truly don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that every single step she took was destructive in some way, which is probably why it's for the best that she didn't really take all that many steps. She was a Pekingese, and I once read that Pekingeses were bred so that Chinese noblemen could store them in their sleeves all day in case they were attacked, at which point they'd use the dogs as melee weapons by throwing them at their attackers, and like, that doesn't sound like it's super true, but if it is, then it explains literally everything about my dog's personality. She was just sedentary until it was time to ruin someone else's day. If I were to make a pie chart of my dog's daily schedule, I'd say that it was about 98% sleeping and 2% fucking shit up. And like, on paper, that might sound like a pretty manageable schedule to deal with as a dog owner, but believe me when I tell you that that wasn't always the case, because Lily had a sixth sense for 
picking the worst possible time to wake up and make our lives difficult. I'd be headed out the door for an appointment I was already running late for, and she'd sit up and decide it was time for a walk. Or I'd be going to bed, and she'd decide that, actually, no, I'm not, because she was hungry. And unfortunately, ignoring her was never an option, because if she needed something, she needed it now. If she didn't get it, she'd just wander around the apartment aimlessly until she did, like some lost spirit trapped in between heaven and hell just looking for a place to rest, and that never led to anything good. Whenever Lily was left to her own devices, our lives became infinitely more stressful, because not only did we know she was going to do something bad, but we also had no way of knowing what that bad thing was going to be. It didn't matter how many possible outcomes we planned for, Lily would always manage to do something way worse that we never even considered. One time she got hungry in the middle of the night when nobody was awake to tend her every whim, and as a result, she somehow ended up locking herself inside of our bathroom in a way that I'm still not entirely sure how she managed to pull off. When we woke up, we had no clue where she was, and after tearing up our apartment trying to find her, we realized that she had wedged our cat's litter scoop underneath the bathroom door, making it very difficult for us to open it. And then for good measure, she also kicked all of the litter out of the litter box onto the floor. And I'm pretty sure she also peed on the floor a couple of times that night too. We did our best to prevent stuff like this by trying to wake her up and deal with her needs at times that were convenient for us, but unfortunately, this didn't work because waking her up wasn't really possible. If Lily wanted to sleep, then she was going to sleep. It didn't matter where, or when, or how. If she was tired, she was going to find a bed, bunch it up, and hit the hay, and no mortal man was ever going to tell her otherwise. I'm not even joking. She once decided it was time to sleep while I was getting something out of the refrigerator, and as a result, I could not close the refrigerator. <laughs> watching her sleep was one of the few times in my life where I truly felt like I was watching a master at work because she was just so good at it. She'd curl up into a little croissant, smush her face up so tight that she'd stop having eyes, and then she'd snore like a sailor for 12 hours straight until it was time for her to wake up and do something weirdly stressful again. And obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit here because of course she did other things besides sleeping and making my life difficult, you know. She had hobbies. She, she loved piss. Most of the time when she woke up, it was so that she could pee, but I don't think that what was making her get up was her biological need to empty her bladder so much as I just genuinely think that she loved pissing so much that it was the reason she got out of bed every morning. She loved it so much, in fact, that she rarely waited in order to do it. She'd usually take about two steps from her bed before she'd squat down wherever she was and just let it flow. And you know, it wasn't my favorite habit of hers, but unfortunately, it wasn't really a habit that I could get her to kick. No matter how hard I tried. The people who had her before me had her trained to a pee pad, which was not something that I personally would have chosen to do had I been a part of her formative years, and so when she came to live with me, I decided to forego the pee pads altogether in hopes that that would make her save it until it was time to go for a walk. Sadly, that didn't really work out. Instead, Lily decided to just approximate pee pads wherever she could, going on rugs and loose towels and kitchen tiles. But basically anything that was square and on the ground. And by the time I realized that the smell in my bathroom wasn't a broken septic tank, it was the shower mat, I decided that she had bested me in our little war of attrition and finally broke down and bought a box of pads. And I will say this, pee pads aren't my personal cup of tea, but they are convenient. I never had to worry about Lily having an accident if I didn't make it home in time because she'd just go on her pad. For a time. 
As she started getting up there in age, she began to view the pee pads as more of a suggestion than anything. I think she kind of felt like if she could see the pad while she was going to the bathroom, then that was enough. Uh, of course, then she got a little bit older and her eyesight gave out, so things kind of just became a bit of a free-for-all. Rather than putting out one single pee pad for her, we started lining the floor of our apartment with them like we were living in a hamster's cage in hopes that were she to pick a random spot to relieve herself, odds were more likely than not that the spot she chose would be covered. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't really work out, even though it was statistically less likely. She still managed to miss her pee pad more often than not. And hell, even when she made her pad, she'd still sometimes make a mess. There were many times when she somehow managed to pee under them in a way that I'm still very confused by. Like I'd go to clean up for the night and think, well, this one's dry, but then I'd lift it up and find that the underside was covered in a puddle of urine, which adhered it to the ground. And like, again, I'm not entirely sure how she did this, but rest assured that it was way more difficult to clean than if she had just pissed directly onto my floor. And you might think that Lily peeing on my floor wouldn't be that bad because she was just a tiny little thing, but, well, don't let her size fool you. I honestly don't know how she produced as much urine as she did, but between that and the shedding, my only guess is that she was actually just a portal to another dimension that was full of things designed to ruin apartments. And she wasn't just a creator, she was a connoisseur as well. Like, I don't know if there is such a thing as a piss sommelier, but if there is, then Lily definitely was one of them. I'm truly not exaggerating when I say that her greatest joy in life was shoving her face into puddles of urine left behind by other dogs on the street and sniffing them for what felt like hours on end. I used to say that she was watching her stories when she did it because apparently the reason dogs love pee so much is that it is like a little story to them. They can break down smells on a much more fundamental level than us, so when they sniff, they're actually getting all sorts of information that we as humans would not be able to appreciate were we to also sh shove our face into a puddle of dog piss. And whatever special meaning she was finding in those wet spots on the ground must have been very interesting because she was hooked. She would hunker down and get her little snoot all up in there, and she refused to move until someone absolutely made her. And, and then, of course, once you did finally get her to budge, she'd take a couple more steps, find another puddle to inspect, and start the whole process all over again. As you might imagine, for as much fun as those smelly piss spots seemed to be for her, they weren't as enjoyable for whoever happened to be on the other side of her leash. To this day, walking my dog remains one of the most boring things that I have ever done because, well, well, for starters, walking feels like a strong word. It was really more like standing there. I would take her on full 20 minute outings and we would not make it past one single square section of sidewalk. She'd find something to inspect then push my ADHD to its absolute breaking point by inhaling every last speck of odor she could vacuum up inside of her nostrils. I used to look down at her and think, how are you still smelling the exact same goddamn spot? My God, your life is trivial. Then I'd do my best to pull her along and she'd just look up at me like, excuse you, this is important to me, so uh, you're just gonna have to wait. And then I usually would wait, because she was Lily. She was an objectively terrible creature, but she was my terrible creature. Love is weird and messy, and it doesn't always make a whole hell of a lot of sense, but when it's there, it's really hard to try and deny. I loved Lily, and in her own weird way, she loved me, and not only was that one of the greatest joys in my life for all the years that I knew her, but... It also really sucks sometimes because love can be very difficult. I think one of the best and worst parts about being a dog owner is the fact that when you adopt a dog, you basically become their whole universe. They look at you like this magical, godlike being who can do absolutely everything. and That kind of makes you want to try to live up to those expectations however you can, which is difficult because despite what they think, you can't actually do everything. From the moment I got her, I was responsible for her. The weight of whether she lived or died rested squarely on my shoulders, and that weight was a heavy one, because Lily always kind of seemed like she was about to die. 
When I first got her in 2016, the people I adopted her from told me she was four, but then I took her to a vet who found a chip in her that had been implanted in 2008, meaning that she was actually at least eight. And from the moment I watched as her age doubled in an instant, it was kind of hard for me to look at her and not think about her mortality on some level. I was keenly aware that someday sooner than I'd hoped for, the end was coming, and whether consciously or unconsciously, I made a lot of decisions based around that fact. I know this probably sounds insane, but before I had Lily, I was never hugely interested in the idea of a relationship, but after realizing that I would not be able to handle her final moments alone, I opened my mind up to the possibility, and as a result, I've been with the same person for the past six years. And, and like, for the record, the looming dread I felt over my dog's inevitable demise isn't the only reason that we're still together, but... It definitely played a role in opening my mind up to the possibility of companionship in a way that was for sure not healthy. And my fear of Lily's death didn't just affect my love life, it kind of affected everything. I became so obsessed with making sure she was okay that it started to dictate my day-to-day -day life to a much greater degree than I'd care to admit. Any slight perceived malady in my mind would immediately flash forward to the image of me at her deathbed. And Seeing as Lily was a horribly designed creature who was mostly maladies, this got very taxing after a while. A lot of my concerns revolved around her eating habits. I think my mom got tired of dealing with the constant phone calls from me asking if my dog was dying, so eventually she told me that as long as Lily was eating, she's probably fine. And rather than taking that as the chill pill it was clearly intended to be, I instead began to hyper-focus on every morsel that entered her stupid little mouth, and any time she acted slightly out of the norm, I would use her food intake as a way to confirm or refute my suspicions that she was on death's door. Her favorite food was chicken. I firmly believed that she would murder me without a second's thought if it meant that she got a small cube of chicken breast, so whenever I sensed that something might be up, I would cook up a little bit of it for her and put it in front of her snout. Usually, she would eat it right up and my nerves would be calm, and then I get to enjoy her eating chicken, which was always adorable. Occasionally she'd put her nose up at it though, and then I'd freak out and brace myself for the worst until usually about an hour later when she decided that she was hungry and inevitably started eating again because... Well, my chicken test system was not a science, and I feel like the only thing it ever actually proved was my own neuroses. If anything, it probably made things a lot worse. Lily's breed is notorious for being picky eaters, and they will often refuse food they're given if they think they're missing out on something better. So I'm pretty sure that any time I gave her chicken, the only thing that it did was remind her that she liked chicken, and so then she stopped eating her normal food because it wasn't chicken, and then I'd be so worried that she was dying, and to check to make sure she wasn't, I'd give her more chicken. It was a vicious cycle. And of course, this all got way worse when she started having seizures. It was hard not to walk around eggshells around her, because you never knew what might stress her out enough to trigger one. Hell, I don't even think she knew. She could be triggered by something as simple as having her nails clipped, but way worse things could also happen to her, and she wouldn't even be phased. One time I ran our off-brand Roomba and went to the bathroom, and when I came back, her tail had gotten caught in the spinning brushes and sucked up into the vacuum, and not only was she not triggered by that, she literally cared about it so little that she was sleeping comfortably. Uh, like honestly, I feel like the only part of that whole situation that seemed to upset her at all was me waking her up to try and untangle her ass hair so I could get the damn thing off of her. And because her whims were such a crapshoot, I did my best to err on the side of caution, and in doing so, I always ended up spotting an endless array of new potential hazards to be cautious of in a way that ended up getting really stressful. Like, they say that moving is one of the most stressful things a person can experience, and that was very much true for me when I moved from California to New York, but for me, the stressful part wasn't the move 
so much as how Lily factored into the move. She had not been on an airplane since she started having seizures, so I wasn't really sure how she'd respond to it. Traditionally, she had been a very good little flyer, but who knows? I personally get so stressed out when I'm flying that I want to scream at the top of my lungs and then void my bowels, so who's to say that the same couldn't be true about Lily as well? On top of that was the fact that her dying of a seizure in the middle of a cross-country flight would have been very inconvenient for me, and so that made me fairly certain that that's when it would happen, because like I said, Lily truly was a master of terrible timing. I had no idea where or how Lily was going to die, but one thing I did feel confident about was when, and that when was whenever would be the worst possible time for me. I'm being completely serious when I say that the only time I wasn't constantly stressing out about Lily was when I'd look at my calendar and be like, I guess there's nothing coming up that would be made way more difficult by her dying, so I guess that means she's going to live at least until this wedding I'm going to in June. And truly, there was no worse, more inconvenient way for her to go than on my 1025 to JFK, because, like, what am I even supposed to do in that situation? Not only would I have to deal with the utter ghoulishness that would be a cramped five-hour flight with my dog's body at my feet, but my seatmates would, too. I'm, I'm pretty sure I was in the middle. And, like, I feel guilty asking people to get up so I can go to the bathroom, so Lord knows how I would react to having to let the person next to me know that they'd be sharing the remainder of their flight with the corpse of a Pekingese. I guess the obvious solution would be to move the body somewhere, but, like, where? I can't imagine it would go over very well if I rang the little call button only to be like, Hi, yeah, I'm so sorry to do this to you, but my dog actually died. Is there any chance we could go ahead and store her in the overhead compartment? And it's not like I just land and I'm instantly home, so what do I do once I'm on the ground? Would I take her body through customs and get into a cab with it, or is there like a sky cap or something I could hand her off to and be like, here, cremate this for me? All of these unpleasant thoughts and then some flood in my head, and As with a lot of worries I had related to Lily, they started to overwhelm me. This may surprise a lot of you watching this, but I can be a little bit obsessive sometimes, and with Lily, I could obsess over her to the point that it would consume whole weeks of my life. And by extension, the lives of a lot of people around me. I'd talk my worries over with my mom and Matt and my therapist and anyone else with an earshot in a way that even at the time I knew was over the top, I just couldn't help myself. And whenever someone would watch me spiral for long enough, they'd all eventually ask me the same question, and that was, why are you stressing out over her so much? She's just a dog. And every time someone said that to me, I knew on some level that they were right. It didn't make me stop worrying, but still, they were right. Which, like, for the record, everyone who would say that to me was a dog lover themselves. They weren't saying that nobody should care about their dogs because dogs don't matter. They were just pointing out that as much as I loved her, Lily probably wasn't feeling the same amount of stress and existential dread that I was. I can say pretty confidently that I took good care of her and did everything I could to make her comfortable while she was alive, and that was probably all she really cared about. Short of making her immortal, there wasn't anything else I could really do, so logically the only thing I was accomplishing by worrying about her that much was making myself feel terrible. And if stuff like this functioned logically, then hearing them say this probably would have made me chill out a little bit, but unfortunately it doesn't, so instead I just keep on stressing myself out down to the nub, worrying about things that I couldn't change. One day, after watching me spin my wheels for half a session, my therapist stopped and asked me point-blank what it was exactly that had me so worried about Lily's death. And weirdly, despite the fact that a lot of the thoughts that plagued my brain at the time hinged entirely on that question, the answer to it never once crossed my mind. So I thought about it, and when I came up with an answer that felt right, it was strange, because it definitely was not what I was expecting it to be. Because truth told, I don't think I was really all that concerned with Lily dying. I was mostly just freaked out about her death. 
Like, don't get me wrong, I wasn't excited about the idea of Lily dying, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't kind of ready for it on some level. You wake up to enough puddles of piss in your kitchen, and you start to understand the value of letting things pass when their time comes. I don't know if I would have admitted it at the time, but if I were to actually think about the reality of Lily dying back then, I think the strongest emotion I would have felt would have been relief. I loved her dearly, but she was stressful. It got to a point with her where I would often think, like, she is so old and decrepit at this point that there is no possible way she can make my life any more difficult than it already is. And every time I would think that, she would, without fail, manage to get even older and even more decrepit in a way that made my life infinitely more difficult. My head knew it was her time to go, but my heart was still doing everything in its power to prevent it because it operated under a very different set of rules than my head, and it was just never going to be ready. When I thought about the idea of Lily dying, I never thought about the prospect of clean floors or the feeling of relief that would come for not having to worry about her constantly. I just thought about her lying dead. And the thought of that really fucked with me. I feel like this isn't really a controversial statement, but the concept of death really freaks me out. The idea that in a moment we go from these animated creatures with thoughts and feelings and favorite foods to these hunks of meat with nothing behind the eyes is incomprehensible, no, no matter how much of my life I spend trying to comprehend it. And honestly, when I think about it like that, I realize that my anxiety over Lily dying wasn't really anxiety at all. It was something closer to stress. I knew that pretty soon... I was going to be forced to try and comprehend the incomprehensible. Bracing for Lily's death was kind of like if someone told me that someday soon I was going to be forced to solve Fermat's last theorem, and then when I asked them when this would happen, they said, who knows? And when I asked them what would happen if I didn't solve it, they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, like, I don't know, maybe nothing, or maybe the whole world will explode. And, like, obviously I'm never going to solve Fermat's last theorem because... Well, truth told, I don't even know what it is. I just asked Matt for the name of a hard math equation, and that was the one he gave me. But still, if I were in that situation, I feel like I'd have no choice but to break out some textbooks and try my best to solve it, even though I know on some level that I'm just going to end up spinning my wheels, drowning in a bunch of thoughts and ideas that I'm never going to fully understand. Which, like, for the record, I have dealt with death before. I've lost grandparents and aunts and uncles and more pets than you can count over the course of my medium-sized life. But before Lily, I don't think that I ever really had to face it. All those other times were hard, but I was never the one in the driver's seat. All I had to do before was be sad and finally remember the good times and pray to God that my funeral suit still fit from the last one. With Lily, it would be different, though. It would be my death. I'd be the one there with her when she passed. I'd be the one to make sure her remains were dealt with. I'd be the one making all the calls to let people know she was gone. And when people responded to those calls by fondly remembering the good times, I'd be the one who would have to carry those memories with me wherever I go. I think this is why when I thought about Lily's death, one of the most pervasive fears that popped into my mind was the possibility that I'd have to choose to put her down. The only thing I really knew was that I didn't really know anything, and so the idea of making any decision, much less one that was a literal matter of life or death, was not something that I ever wanted to do. And I know this all sounds really dramatic, because again, she was just a dog, but no matter how many times I tried to tell myself that, I couldn't make myself believe it, so instead I just carried around the inevitability of Lily's death like a weight in the pit of my stomach, just always kind of bracing for the possibility that Pretty soon, my world might explode. And like I said, it did not take much for me to think that the worst was about to happen. Any slight movement or noise from Lily that was out of the ordinary in any way, and I'd instantly think like this is it, and start bracing my body for the death of my best friend in a way that, not gonna lie, did take its toll on me. Still, no matter how much of my brain space I had devoted to expecting my dog's demise, when the time actually came, I did not think it was actually happening. I think I had been so dramatic in the years leading up to it that I kind of trained myself to believe that any time I thought Lily might be dying, I was overreacting. So when she actually was dying, my first thought was like, nah, you've been wrong about this so many times before. Stop being a drama queen. 
It all started when I realized that Lily hadn't really been eating too much, just as my mom had predicted all those years ago. And so when I realized that her food bowl was conspicuously untouched, I employed my chicken test system to try and prove to myself that everything was okay. I went to the corner market, grabbed a pack of chicken thighs, and fried one up for the little gal. And then I proceeded to lie down on the kitchen floor and feed it to her nibble by nibble. It took a very long time, and she didn't have the same verve while eating it that she usually had when chicken was involved, but eventually she ate the whole thing, so I took that as proof that everything was okay. Pro probably because I really wanted to believe at that moment that everything was okay. I went about my day as usual, albeit with a slightly larger lump in my stomach than normal, and whenever thoughts of Lily would pop into my head, I'd do my best to drown them out. You have thought she was dying a million times before, and you've never been right, I told myself. Stop being so dramatic. She, she ate the chicken. And by using these repression skills that I have been honing since childhood, I was able to keep putting one foot in front of the other as though that day were just like every other, even though something about it really felt off, and after putting my foot in front of the other enough times, I eventually found my way back home. W where I was greeted with some of the worst diarrhea that I have ever seen in my life. In, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have given her that chicken. And like, if you've made it this far into the video, you've already shown that you're willing to put up with a lot. So I'm not gonna press my luck in terms of audience retention by getting too graphic here, but I will say this. After seeing the mess that Lily had made while I was away, one of my first thoughts was, this dog had better be dying because, well, if I can't bathe her, then I have no idea how I'm going to deal with this. Still, Lily being disgusting wasn't really that out of the ordinary, so her gastrointestinal woes didn't feel like proof positive that this was it, and other than that, she was kind of just doing what she did every other day, which was chilling in her bed doing nothing. The only tangible evidence I had that something was off was the intense feeling in the pit of my stomach that something was off, and I wasn't really sure if that was the result of some sort of parental bond I had with her or just OCD, and so I kind of just sat there watching her in her bed, waiting for any sort of update to tell me how I was supposed to feel. The more I watched her, the more anxious about her I became, and the more anxious about her I became, the more I tried to tell myself that I should stop overreacting because my anxieties are very rarely rooted in reality. The biggest thing I was struggling with at that point was whether or not I should call Matt. If Lily was dying, I knew he'd want to know so he could be there, but he, he, he also had plans that day to ironically watch the movie Lyle Lyle Crocodile with his friends, and I didn't want to ruin them with a false alarm. And like, I know that it might sound silly that I might prioritize the movie Lyle Lyle Crocodile and literally anyway in this situation, but Matt is currently in grad school, so he doesn't get a lot of nights out like that. And I didn't really want to put a damper on this one unless it was absolutely necessary. Also, not for nothing, but if you've watched this video, then you probably have a sense by now of just how frustrating my anxieties can be. And unlike you guys, Matt can't really press pause on dealing with those anxieties, so on the off chance that Lily wasn't dying, the possibility that I'd become so neurotic that it literally started to interfere with his schedule didn't really seem fair to him. That said though, the idea that he wouldn't be there for the passing of his dog so that he could instead be in the 715 showing of Lyle Lyle Crocodile also didn't seem very fair to him, so I genuinely had no idea what to do. I went back and forth and eventually decided that I'd call him, but just to tell him that I was anxious so that he could decide for himself what he wanted to do. And I'm very happy that I made that call because the moment that I did, Lily started yelping in a way that I had never heard her do before. Matt heard her cries in the background of our phone call and immediately bailed on his movie night to get on the next train home he could manage. And while I sat there waiting for him, I did the only thing I could think to do in that moment, which was to pet my dog. I pet Lily a lot that night. As, as a matter of fact, I barely ever stopped petting her. The only time I did was when I stepped back so that Matt could take over. We just wanted her to know that we were there for her, you know? We wanted to make sure that whatever last moments she had on this earth were filled with love and support. And 
I'm really happy that we were able to do that for her. E even though it was really, really gross. Like I said, years of refusing to let us bathe her without threatening to die had left Lily's coat extremely oily, and the hours upon hours we spent touching her fur had left our hands covered in a film that could only be described as gunky. It was so bad that even though I was going through one of the hardest nights of my life, after hour three or so, I couldn't help but take a picture to document it. And like, I hesitate to show you guys that picture because it's really disgusting. But after some soul searching, I've decided that I'm gonna do it anyway because I contend that this is what love looks like. It sounds silly to say in retrospect, but even by the time Mac got home, we still weren't entirely sure that she was definitely on the way out. Lily had a long and colorful track record of making it seem like she was dying, only to get up a couple hours later and ask for food like nothing had happened, and we weren't prepared to admit to ourselves yet that that's not what was happening here too. Our denial was so bad that at one point we decided that it might be a good idea to clip her nails. She, she was normally so fussy about it that we took every opportunity we could to clip them, and she had never been this immobile before, so part of us felt like it was the perfect time. Are you sure we should be doing that? I'm, I'm pretty sure she's dying right now. I know, but if she's not, then we might not get another chance like this for a while. Th th they've gotten really long. Eventually, her breaths got weird enough and the light in her eye grew dim enough that denial stopped being an option. I think that anyone who's been in this sort of situation knows that you'll inevitably get to a point where it becomes clear that the only thing left to do is to look to the universe for answers and wait, and we had finally reached that point. And that honestly sucked for Lily, because like I said, I basically was her entire universe, and at that moment in time, I didn't really have any answers. It was probably around 5.30 at night when both Matt and I had finally accepted that this was happening. Pretty soon, our dog would be gone. Unfortunately, soon is a very relative term. I feel like we always talk about how short life is, but one thing that we never seem to talk about is how goddamn long it takes to die, so I really wasn't ready for what was about to happen. I'm being completely serious when I say that I have never felt more ADD than I did while I was watching my beloved pet die. Like, I think part of me thought that in moments like that, adrenaline or something would kick in to override my typical neurodivergence and allow me to focus on Lily for as long as she needed to comfortably pass, but apparently that is not the case. I was devastated, sure, but I was also just bored out of my mind. I, I kind of felt like Millhouse waiting for Poochie to get to the fireworks factory, you know? I, I knew what was coming, and so each moment that it didn't come, I got antsier and antsier. Eventually, it got bad enough that I decided that I needed to put on some TV in the background, and that just opened up a whole other can of worms for me, because, like, what the hell show are you supposed to watch while your dog dies? I spent a solid 20 minutes with one hand petting Lily and the other hand using the remote to scroll through Hulu to try and find a show that I liked enough that it would keep my attention, but not so much that I'd be upset to forever associate it with the death of my dog. And eventually, I settled on Abbott Elementary, which, like, very good show, but I, I don't think that I'm ever going to watch it again. It didn't help matters that Lily had multiple fakeouts over the course of the night where it seemed like she was about to die, and those just made the whole process feel even longer. First it was heavy breathing, then it was twitching, then it was these weird clicking things she started doing with her jaw, and each time we clenched up thinking her moment had finally come. Th 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 then each time she went back to looking like she had before, refusing to die on anyone else's schedule but her own like the princess that she was. I had spent literal years of my life where the possibility that I would have to put my dog down was my absolute greatest fear, but after watching Lily die for three hours, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't really in the cards for me anymore.
I didn't really want to transfer her to a vet in the state that she was in, and apparently all the doggy euthanizers who make house calls take Friday evenings off, so I had no choice but to just wait for Mother Nature to put her down for me, and unfortunately, Mother Nature was taking her sweet-ass time. After a few more fake-outs, it was bedtime, and so Matt and I brought some blankets and pillows and put them on the floor of the kitchen so we could sleep next to her, which... In hindsight, it was a very weird choice for us to make because, well, I guess I can't speak for Matt. I know that I personally would never be able to fall asleep knowing that the next morning I would be waking up to a dog corpse next to me in bed. Still, I guess all choices are weird in situations like this. So we made our beds and turned off the lights. And a few minutes later, almost as though she had been waiting for us to leave her alone, Lily passed away. I had dreaded this moment for years now, and I think I kind of always assumed that when it happened, I would have this big existential moment that would change my life forever, but if we're being honest, the only thing I could really think as I stood there looking at my best friend's lifeless body was, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Like I said, Lily truly had the most inconvenient timing of any creature I have ever met, and that remained true in death as well. She finally passed around 3.30 in the morning, and like, I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried disposing of a dog corpse in Brooklyn, but as it turns out, 3.30 in the morning is one of the absolute worst times to try and do it. My first inclination was to just put a blanket over her and deal with things in the morning when everything opened up again, but the reality of this felt way too depressing to actually follow through on. Uh, like, I'm already not much of a morning person, and I truly couldn't think of a worse way to wake up. Also, not for nothing, but given how she smelled when she was alive, God only knows what odor she'd start producing once the decomposition process kicked in, and frankly, I didn't want that anywhere near my kitchen. My next idea was to put her outside for a bit to let her air out, but that went out the window the second I ran it past my mom and was told to make sure I wrapped her up tight in a trash bag before I did it. I asked her why, and when I was told that it was so the rats didn't get to her, I decided that the prospect of that was way too ghoulish to risk, and so I went back to the drawing board. Eventually, out of ideas, I decided to Google the nearest 24-hour veterinarian and ask them what I was supposed to do next. Hi, yeah, good evening. So, uh, my dog just died, and I don't really know what I'm supposed to do right now. On the other side of the line was an extremely kind woman who was surprisingly chipper given the fact that she had more than likely sacrificed sleep for the opportunity to deal with hordes of suffering animals, and she informed me that they actually had a crematorium there. I just had to bring her in. Hearing her say that was the first time that night that things didn't feel insurmountable, but unfortunately, my little win only lasted for a few seconds because after thinking about it for a moment, I realized that... Oh no, they still are. Just bring her in sounded so easy when she said it on the phone, but the unfortunate reality was that the vet was an hour plus walk away from where I lived, and I do not own a car. Just out of curiosity, how do people normally get to you guys? I asked through stifled tears, and she suggested that I call an Uber. Is, is that allowed? I asked, and she told me that you didn't need to tell the driver what you were doing, which, well, well, I guess that's probably true. Something about it just didn't sit right with me. For one thing, while it is true that we didn't need to tell the Uber driver what we were doing, I feel like once we got into the back seat of their car with tear stains on our face and a suspiciously motionless dog carrier on our way to the 24-hour veterinarian, they would probably be able to put together that something was up. More than that though, something about smuggling my dog's corpse into someone else's car just felt kind of cruel. I thought about what it must be like to be out there driving Ubers at 3.30 a.m. on a Friday night and figured that whoever would pick me up was probably already having a bad time. And since I was definitely having a bad time, the idea of dragging their bad time into my bad time wasn't something that I really wanted to follow through on. Out of desperation, I started ringing up everyone in my phone book I could think of who lived nearby and had a car. 
I wasn't really hopeful that this would work because again, it was probably four at this point, but by some great miracle, my brother picked up and in the greatest act of being there for someone I have ever experienced in my life, he told me that not only could I use his car, but he was going to drive me there. So that, that was nice. While we waited for him to come grab us, we fished around the pile of junk we kept stored between the couch and the living room wall and grabbed her carrying case to load her up for her final car ride. I picked her up for a brief moment to put her in and it was the first time since she had passed that I actually held her, which was weird. She, she, she felt so much lighter. Walking around with her body in the carrier caused me to flash back to all the times I had loaded her in there in order to travel. I remembered all the times she'd shift her weight or grumble in disapproval or do any number of other things that made running to catch a train feel like a trial of endurance, but walking with her now felt as effortless as carrying around dirty clothes in a duffel bag. It was much easier. And, and that just made everything that much harder. Entering the vet, I was struck by how clean everything was. I, I think in my head I had been expecting it to be like one of the 24-hour emergency rooms you see in television, you know, just filled with cats holding rags to the bloody wounds on their paws and drunken ferrets handcuffed to chairs in the lobby while they sobered up, but everything there was just weirdly nice. Weirder still was the fact that everyone there was really nice to us in a way that I was not expecting. I mean, I guess in hindsight it does make sense. Our dog just died and they knew that, but still, I had never experienced a job firsthand that I would want less than that of 24-hour emergency vet, so I was truly impressed by how kind everyone was because I feel like they probably could have gotten away with way less. Like, maybe I was just tired and desperate at that point, but I feel like they probably could have told us to fuck ourselves, then kicked Matt in the shins, and I would still consider it some of the greatest customer service that I've ever experienced. A bleary-eyed receptionist led Matt, Lily, and I to a weird room in the back and showed us a laminated menu of our cremation options. And after we'd closed our eyes and pointed to a picture at random, she went away to start making arrangements. A few moments later, the undertaker at the 24-hour vet, who truly has the job that I want least in the world, came back and started asking us a bunch of more specific questions. When do you need her ashes by? Would you like an imprint of her paw? Stuff like that. Of all the questions she asked, my favorite was whether or not Matt and I would like her to snip off a lock of Lily's hair for us, because... Well, for one thing, if she could have seen our apartment at that moment in time, she would have known that we were not wanting for locks of Lily's hair. Also, no judgments, but for me personally, the idea of wrapping a lock of dog hair in a bow and displaying it in some shrine to my fallen pet felt like the first step in my journey to having my own episode of Hoarders, so I politely declined. The undertaker went away for a few more minutes and then she came back and told us that she had all the information she needed and it was time to take Lily away. Would you like to say goodbye? She asked. And if you had asked me a month earlier what I would have done in that moment, I would have said that I'd wrap my arms around her until the sunrise, screaming, it should have been me. But instead, I just kind of giggled and said I was good. You see, when the undertaker lifted up her carrier to take her away, I caught a glimpse of her body through the mesh side paneling for the first time since I got out of my brother's car. And I think she had just been jostled so many times by the journey because she ended up kind of looking like this, like, I don't know, maybe I was just delirious at that point, but it was funny and I don't think that it would have been very conducive to a proper goodbye. We left the vet and finally made our way into bed, beating the sunrise by just a few moments, and it was all weirdly matter of fact. The existential crisis I had spent years bracing myself for didn't happen. I just got under the covers like every other night and went to sleep. And that's not to say that it never happened, but it wasn't the massive flood of emotions I was expecting it to be. In actuality, it's been much more like a few drips here and there for an extended period of time, just drip, drip, dripping, 
slowly boring a cavern-sized hole in my psyche and filling the pit of my stomach with, with stalactites. Or stalagmites, which, whichever one hangs from the ceiling. It'll happen suddenly. I'll be sitting alone in my living room and catch a moment of silence where I realize that the white noise in my apartment no longer includes Lily's snores. Or I'll empty my vacuum and notice less white hair clogging the filter than last time and wonder if maybe I should have taken that lady up on her offer of a lock of fur. Hell, even the parts of Lily's death that have objectively improved my life still make me a little bit wistful. I still tiptoe around my kitchen every morning in efforts to avoid puddles and don't get me wrong, I'm very happy that I don't have to step and piss anymore, but... Well, at the same time, something about it just doesn't feel right. One thing I've learned since Lily passed is that a lot of the cliches concerning grief are cliches for a reason. I feel silly about it sometimes, but I'd be lying if I said I haven't been asking myself the sorts of questions that I would have made fun of myself for including in a script a year ago, you know? Does it mean anything? Is there anything more? In the grand scheme of things, is there even a point? And I will be honest, my gut reaction to all of those questions is to say no, because, well, that kind of feels like the easiest answer. Especially when Lily is concerned. I was present for just about every second of her life since the moment I got her, and when I actually stopped to do the math on everything that I saw, it doesn't really add up to all that much. I keep flashing back to those boring walks I'd have to take her on, which, like I said, were the absolute high point of her life, and I keep repeating in my mind the phrase that I used to yell at her when she refused to budge from whatever she was sniffing. My God, your life is trivial. And like at the time, I meant it mostly as a joke, but replaying it in my head on a continuous loop, it's hard not to feel like I was saying more than I intended to. The idea that Lily was some sort of magical cog in this grand cosmic machine was a very hard pill to swallow. If I were to really try and come up with the most logical answer to any of the broad questions I found myself asking the universe, I feel like the answer to all of them would be that she was, as many people tried to tell me over the years, just a dog. Still, for as tempting as nihilism can be in the face of grief, I don't know that I'll ever fully be able to buy into it, because... Well, she wasn't just a dog, she was Lily. Sometimes I think back to that last moment before Lily's body was hauled away to be turned into ashes, and I wonder why I was able to laugh. And The answer I keep coming up with was that whatever was in that carrier wasn't Lily. It looked like Lily, and felt like Lily, and smelled like Lily, and probably tasted like Lily too, but... It wasn't her. Lily was the feeling of calm I'd get from knowing that she was calm. She was the gross little kisses she'd give out so sparingly that they felt special even though they smelled horrid, and the little kick I got out of all the terrible things she did even though they were a pain in my ass, and all sorts of other things that I don't think I could ever possibly put into words. I talked before about how incomprehensible that moment between life and death has always been for me, and Having seen it firsthand now, well, if anything, it's way more incomprehensible, but that said, it's a lot less scary up close. I don't know what happened that changed Lily from Lily into whatever was hauled off to that crematorium that night, but whatever it was was so vastly beyond my understanding that it's hard to think about it long enough and not come away feeling like there's got to be way more to the world than just what our senses are able to pick up. If you guys want my honest answers to those questions I kept asking in the wake of losing Lily, then the answers would be yes. Yes, it means something. Yes, there's more. And yes, there is a point. Grant granted, I can't really get more specific with any of those answers, but maybe that's okay. Then again, maybe these are just things that I'm telling myself to try and feel better and the truth is that we are just these meaningless little blips in the grand scheme of things, but if that's the case, then maybe that's okay too. The more I think about those boring, inconsequential walks that were the high point of Lily's life, the more I'm comforted by the fact that, you know who didn't think that they were boring and inconsequential? 
Lily. I have truly never seen someone more confident that what they had found was worthwhile than Lily, even though the worthwhile thing that she found was nothing more than a puddle of urine. And it might sound silly to say, but there's something genuinely kind of inspiring about that. The more I reminisce about those walks, the less they feel like a dog holding me up while I'm just trying to get home to eat dinner, and the more they feel like someone defiantly digging their feet in and fighting for what's truly important to them in a way that I think a lot of us could stand to learn a lesson from. Because at the end of the day, we're all just sniffing at piss, you know? Just trying to find meaning in a big smelly mess where maybe there isn't any. But regardless of if it's actually there or not, if you can manage to find that meaning, then maybe that alone means that it's real. Maybe Lily was objectively the worst, but that doesn't mean that she couldn't be the best to me. When all is said and done, Lily really was just a dog, but she was my dog, and she was important to me, and in the grand scheme of things, maybe that's all that really matters. So yeah, that's my video. I'm sorry it was a little heavier than normal, but I hope it was still fun at points. I don't know, I still tried to make it funny. Not sure if it really worked out, but... I'll keep things brief this time around and just say like, subscribe, and if you did like it, then please, please, please consider sharing. Like I said, I don't know that it's going to do particularly well because of the subject matter, and if you can tell someone that it's worth watching, then I feel like that will help people watch it. But yeah, other than that, I don't have much to say, so I'll just see you guys later. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, real fans. It's time for everyone's favorite part of the video where I pose for a thumbnail photo while my patrons' names scroll up the screen. And uh, for this one, I actually bought props because I'm really worried that people will not click on this video because they think it'll be sad. And I did try to make it as funny as possible. So I really want to convey that in the thumbnail. So um, I brought a rubber chicken and I bought a clown horn, and I bought these uh, Groucho Marx glasses. So I'm gonna put those on, and uh, let's start posing. Um, so, yaka yaka. So like, it's gonna say, my dog died, a comedy video, and then I'm bringing the comedy, so. Honka, ooh. Um, let's see. I feel like I don't need to pose very much because of, I feel like they're going to do this, so I just need to get them clear in the shot, so like. Uh, huh. I would, I would move the, ho the clown horn is really loud, so. I don't know if that's picking up on mic, but, um, so. <laughs> and then there's just going to be a picture of Lily behind me. It's very inappropriate, but these are the things that I do in order to try and maintain a certain number of views on my channel. It's not going to work, but... Alright, so... Hanka. I, I feel like there's not much I can do with these, so... Boom! Like a silly face. Blah. Um... I feel like there's a chance that this is going to be more confusing to people. They're going to be like, why are you wearing glasses in the thumbnail? Should I grow a mustache? I can't. I can't actually grow a mustache. I don't know why I would ask that question. Um, hopefully there's something there. I don't know. I'll see you guys later. I hope you guys aren't too bummed out by that video. Hello, even realer fans. Um, I was thinking about it, and um, since that video was a lot to take, I did want to leave it on a very happy note. And um, it took me a while to write, and in the time I wrote it, I actually got a new puppy. So I wanted to end this video by introducing you guys to him. So uh, this is Dipper. Um, he's very fluffy, and he's very sweet, 
and he has some very big shoes to fill. But yeah, talk to you guys soon.